All right, everyone. Um, thank you for joining our webinar today on health hazards associated with the aftermath of hurricanes. We're going to go ahead and get us started. Um, my name is Jessica Bunting, and I am the CPWR host and tech support for this event. Um, for anyone unfamiliar with CPWR, the Center for Construction Research and Training, we are a nonprofit focused on improving the health and safety of construction workers, and we do this in a number of ways, um, which includes our training programs and the development of resources like those that you will hear about today. So before we get started, I just want to go over a few quick things. Um, first, if you are having any technical difficulties, you can email me by responding to the um, WebEx reminder email that went out 30 minutes ago. Or if you're logged in, you can just send me a message in the chat box. Um, if they're not already displayed on the right-hand uh, side of your screen, you can add the chat and Q&A boxes by clicking on the associated round buttons that appear towards the bottom of your screen when you move your mouse. Um, if you have any trouble hearing through your computer speakers at any point, I recommend calling in um, using your phone instead as it is not dependent on the internet bandwidth. Um, we'll, we will take time at the end of today's presentation to answer questions, and you can enter those questions in the Q&A or chat box at any time during the presentation. We'll do our best to answer all of them at the end. The webinar will also be recorded in full. I will automatically email that link to everyone who is registered um, following the event, <clears throat> and then you can share it with colleagues or whatever. Um, our presenter today is Mike Kassman, and Mike is CPWR's Director of OSHA and Disaster Response Training. And he will provide an overview of both the hazards associated with hurricane response as well as a number of resources that are available today. And thank you, Mike, for joining us. I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Je uh, Jessica. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as, as we pointed out, today's webinar is going to be on, on hurricanes. I think it's a good time. Um, as you realize, the, the hurricane season runs um, it's pretty lengthy, it runs from May uh, all the way down to November. So we've still got uh, another month or month and a half, two months um, worth of potential hurricanes coming around. Um, as you can see, um, you know, a hurricane uh, <clears throat> can affect areas more than 100 miles inland. Okay, and based on the severity of the uh, of the winds and um, the categories using this Cephas Simpson hurricane scale. Um, as you're probably all aware, the hurricanes can go from a category one all the way through five. And as the wind speed increases, so does the, the category. Um, category five, just recently, you just seen the aftermath of Dorian from the Bahamas, which is kind of devastated. Um, there's been a few category fives in the last few years. And here's a chart that's probably uh, very, uh, <clears throat> got a lot of information on here based on the wind speed, how they judge um, the, uh, <clears throat> the categories. As, as the wind speed increases, the categories increase as well. Uh, one of the biggest things on this is also the storm surge, that a lot of people forget. Um, and and that's, that's quite damaging. I got some pictures of some aftermath of recent hurricanes of Harvey and Ike, um, as well as Florence. As you can see, this is not your like normal construction site. I mean, this is uh, you're talking, uh, you know, it's an endless amount of hazards in, in, in a localized area that came through here. Um, slip, trip, and falls areas. I mean, I think uh, this is a combination of a, a hurricane that went through, uh, and perhaps even a tornado that sometimes is developed aftermath. But there's a lot of potentials there as workers go in and clean up this area, whether they're getting paid or volunteer. Um, there's a couple more highlighted pictures as the water um, has receded or the winds have died down. Um, you, you're, you're faced with, uh, you know, an endless amount of cleanup um, and potentially hazards all throughout. So as, a, as a wind, I mean, wind damage is one of the biggest things that, there, uh, that can occur. Um, as you've seen in Dorian, I think the highest wind speed there that was calculated was 185 miles an hour, which is pretty, uh, pretty devastating. So, uh, you know, as you can imagine, you know, anything and anything uh, can, it, could, could be disrupted. Uh, <coughs> trees being, um, trees uh, that are, that, that can fall down and hit, hit a, a adjoining buildings and what have you. Uh, flying objects, signs. 
And here's some other uh, close um, aftermath photos. I think this was um, Hurricane Sandy uh, a couple of years ago up in New Jersey area. He's just, any any structure, all the structures were you know, quite a bit, quite a few structures in that whole vicinity was quite uh, um, uh, quite destroyed. Um, but here's a photo. I mean, this is a few few weeks after the fact. Um, the cleanup is just you can imagine that how taxing the cleanup can be. Um, you know what what you might be coming up and seeing. Uh, you know, um, and even if you even if you're in a residence that was somewhat structurally sound and can, uh, can resist wind damage, one of the things that I kind of mentioned earlier was um, the storm sur surge. Um, you know, so here's a here's a, re a relatively a newer um, you know development, and this is from Harvey, and um, the storm surge had come through there. Uh, you know, and for the most part, people were evacuated out of their homes or they were up on a second level. Um, but it could take days for that water to secede. And even after it's done that, um, you know, the, as you can imagine, uh, the, uh, the whole first floor is, um, is quite compromised. Here's one, it's several city blocks. Um, you know, these are, these are all compromised vehicles, you name it, the whole first floor. Um, at the, fortunately, these last two didn't have a lot of wind damage, as you can see, you know, so they were probably farther inland, you know, however, they were in the low-lie low um, low areas where the storm surge had come through, because um, in the outskirts, um, you don't see, you don't see much uh, uh, water damage. But you can imagine how long, I mean, it's, uh, you know, coming in the aftermath, it's pretty taxing, um, not only for the residences, um, but the workers. Uh, and it could take weeks, weeks to go and clean up a, a particular area. Um, and it's not an overnight situation. And, uh, so you can imagine uh, <clears throat> what type of hazards that you might see as you're going into these residents weeks, at, you know, uh, several several days or weeks after the, a storm that it went through. You know, it's been it's been uh, a lot of these residences were potting water for a, a period of time. You know, uh, you might have dead animals, um, you know, uh, all kinds of uh, dangers inside these, these, these dwellings. Not to mention other typical things like asbestos and lead and uh, other uh, chemicals that, 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 that were stored in the garages or underneath sinks that, um, that are now leaking. Um, and, you know, going back to the previous photograph, um, you know, this water, you know, you can't just think that it's just water. It's a combination of things. Like um, you can refer to it as toxic, toxic soup, you know. So going back into your residence, you know, after you've been away for days, this is what you could be looking at. And looking at this photograph, I mean, where do you begin? What type of toxics you could have in and around? Um, and well, and this obviously is the kitchen area of a home. You know, that's not necessarily all mud; it's sewage. Okay, combination thereof. Um, and, you know, there could be other animals lurking around like snakes and, you know, there's not uncommon to maybe have an alligator or spiders, and, um, um, but it's not your usual construction site. It's, um, it's a pretty hazardous uh, area. Um, so this is what the focus is, you know, the aftermath of a, a particular disaster. You know, what about the workers going in there, whether they're being paid or volunteer? Uh, they have to, you know, you know, it's very important that they have some type of training so that they have an understanding that, you know, there's there's a lot of things that could be lurking in and around um, the water, uh, in and around uh, an area. Um, this one here in particular, you have a worker climbing on top of a debris pile. pile. Um, some of that debris pile could be unstable. There could be nails, um, you know, uh, you name it. Uh, who knows what's, uh, you know, so it's, you know, we should have everybody have a, like an awareness training before they uh, they go in and tackle it. And you know, it's really good to see that a couple of these gentlemen and uh, workers in the in the photograph do have boots on and um, gloves. And in some cases, uh, there might be a pair of safety glasses, but not not everybody. You know, um, so that's that's a potential hazard listing. The next photograph is in some cases, you know, like their water comes through and, you know, they're going to do what they can do to uh, unclog the drain. You know, you realize, you, know, you should realize standing in that water is not clean. You got to do what you got to do to get it done. But following that, you would, you know, you really want to try to get yourself cleaned up. 
salt the water so you don't get any contaminants, what's lurking in that water, because um, it's not just uh, all water. Then you realize in the aftermath of the of the of the storm of this magnitude, depending on you know what's you know whether it's a, a level th uh, category three. Actually, category category twos can have um, tremendous aftermath, but um, when you get to three and four, um, it's not an overnight. It's going to take a little while to clean it up. Uh, here's some photographs of, of Hurricane Sandy. Um, as they, as in some cases, some of the residences even went back, back in back in the houses. But if you can see on the streetscape. I mean, both sides of the street, they're just loaded with refrigerators and furniture and what have you. And now you're talking the winter months because um, it does going to take some time to clean, clean out. Uh, you know, you get it out of your residence, it's going to sit in front of your house. Um, you know, could be could be weeks on end. Again, here's another photograph. Um, you know, and obviously some of these cars, even though they look new, a lot of them are not uh, mobile because they've been flooded. So, uh, but I'm just giving you an example. That it's uh, you know here, this was a Hurricane Sandy I believe happened in July and here it is winter months in New Jersey and uh, they're still faced with cleanup efforts um, even today um, it's it, it, it takes a, a great deal of time so what I, uh, you know what I we're trying to focus is on is the workers that are going in to clean these events um, uh, clean in, in the aftermath of these events that they're well protected okay um, one way of assisting uh, in that progress is an app that was created by uh, with, with in collaboration of CPWR and NIEHS. Um, this app is relatively new, came out in 2017. Um, it's available on Google and Apple, and um, I'm, I encourage you to download the app. Um, it's very good. I mean, once it's downloaded on your phone, um, you can use it as, uh, regardless of the internet. As soon as it's on your phone, it's on there, and you can still use it. And it's got a wealth of information at least give you some first-hand knowledge of what to expect while you're in a, in a particular zone like that um, and uh, of a very a very um, a variety of topics okay as you can see you know there's dirty bonds earthquake uh, it's both in in both English and Spanish I want to point that out so that's pretty um, pretty advantageous to have that okay so I'm going to show you a couple slides that are contained within the app Okay, um, and the app, just like most of the other apps, if you're familiar with downloading an app on your phone, it's very user friendly. Okay, um, and like I said, it's, it's got a wealth of information included in there. But it starts out with an introduction and to identify what type of hazards that are available out there. Okay, the workers' rights. What what what's a what type of rights are, are, are you know um, a worker has in going in an environment like that? How about some training requirements? What type of uh, training requirements are re should be required? How many? What type of hazards? So you realize, uh, depending on what type of disaster you're faced with, whether it's an explosive, um, it could be nuclear, biological, uh, hurricane, you know, uh, tornado. You know, some of them are going to be some related hazards, but some of them are going to be totally different. Each site um, can be classified different. Okay, uh, you might have you're going to have different hazards associated with. Is what I'm getting at. Okay. Um, but you know, uh, you know, just taking a look at this picture. I mean, you know, you have a couple, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, heavy equipment, heavy equipment on site. Um, there's there's some hazards associated working around um, heavy equipment. So you know, the workers that are on the ground, they should be trained um, to know how to avoid, you know, the backhoe there, and um, you know, uh, even even the um, the truck. So. Um, <clears throat> How about some other health hazards such as heat stress, cold stress, traumatic stress? Uh, um, so those are those are those are those are some other added things based on the uh, based on the site, based on the disaster and magnitude of the disaster. Those are other additional hazards that got to be addressed. You know, um, to find out any more, um, you know, employer responsibilities, you can just go right up to the OSHA. Um, <clears throat> Which mandates that the employers are to provide health and safety of the workplace free of recognized hazards. Okay, but initially you got to you know if if you think about it, the initial response of the disaster, in some cases, um, because it's you know they just want it's the initial response. A lot of times it's not uncommon for um, the rules and regulations that are dictated by OSHA are kind of um, suspended in the initial response, and you know that's kind of troublesome. Um, but uh, it's not uncommon to have that happen, okay? But um, as soon as it's up and running, we have to uh, have to make sure that these hazards are addressed because 
um, the workers' lives are at stake. But going through the app um, explains um, everything from, you know, the incident command, as you can see, five organizational functions to allow a manageable span of control. You've got the command, the operations, planning, logistics. There's charts within um, so that you know how the um, chain of command works uh, in the event of a disaster. And, of course, the role of the worker in a, in a cleanup effort. Okay. Um, but as we start going through, and I'll tell you, it's um, a pretty user-friendly app, like I mentioned before. Um, and it goes into how many, you know types of symptoms of exposure, overexposure you might be coming to, like uh, skin irritation, flu-like symptoms, um, sleeplessness, medical, me mental confusion. Um, you know, if you can identify some of these symptoms, and you know you're probably getting exposed. Um, one major emphasis on any worker going into a disaster site is, is of course, respiratory protection. Um, you know, at the very least, you want an N95, but uh, depending on the situation, they might have to be elevated between um, half face or full face, as you see photo in the photo. Okay? The one on the left here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the very first one is a disposable mask at N95. Um, you know, and, and it's a half face mask. It's equivalent to the one in the middle. The only difference is it's a disposable mask. Okay. And then, uh, depending on the contaminants, uh, the full face on the right. Okay. Um, so you know, God forbid you're involved in a, in, in, a, in a situation like this. Um, you know, you, sometimes they, they evacuate the area, and you can't go back in for several weeks thereafter. Um, um, you know, it's, it's suspected that obviously mold's going to start growing in. Um, you know, mold could be a big problem. Okay. It, it, well, it is a big problem. Um, there's, uh, you know, some furnishings can be cleaned of mold, but like drywall and any, uh, you know, s s typical substrates like that will have to be removed and disposed of. Um, but, um, you know, depending on the, the type of furniture or whatever, uh, it's cloth based, obviously that's all going to be taken out, but everything's going to be uh, evaluated, uh, what you can say, what you can't say, because water, water will deteriorate quite, quite a few things, especially it's been sitting there for a while. It's not uncommon in some of these storms in the past that, you know, they were underwater for over a week, you know, so when the water subsides, how soon thereafter can you go in there and start uh, demoing your, your residence? It could be a long time, okay, and that, that mold's going to start growing, okay. Um, one other thing that people often think, uh, you know, overlook is trench foot. Trench foot's been a big common thing. If you're walking in that water for a long period of time with no with no protective boots, uh, rubber boots, uh, you know, you're going to have trench foot. You've probably seen that before. If you, you know, people that have swam quite a few, quite a few uh, length of time. Okay. How about bug-borne pathogens in a cleanup situation like this? I mean, it, you know, um, you've seen some of those uh, pictures that I showed previously where there's damages as far as the eye can see, two by fours, you know, um, residences were no longer there. But the flying debris, uh, you know, it's not uncommon where, you know, a person could be struck, you know. Um, there could be uh, people, there could be uh, people that have died uh, within that debris field. Um, so bloodborne pathogens, body fluids, um, any any of that, um, you want to protect yourself so that you're not a second victim. Um, ideally, if it's possible, if you want to do some pre-incident training and, and be, pre, uh, be prepared before an incident occurs by by having a emergency pack made up. And in that emergency pack, you would have at least a respirator, uh, you know, gloves, uh, a couple pairs, maybe a first aid kit. Um, you know, there's a number of things you can have, flashlight, uh, you know, batteries, pocket knife, and that kind of thing. Safety glasses is, is good, you know, at least a couple pairs, especially if you have children. The last thing you want to do, and I've seen this often, is that you have people are letting their children work or walk around after the events of the storm. And, you know, you got to realize those little guys are, you know, too low to the ground and they're, they're, they're even further exposed than, you know, so that's something that you have to be uh, concerned with. But handling bodies of victims after the fact, that's, that's one thing, you know, the longer, uh, it's, it's unfortunate, but this is what happens, you know. Um, you know, you, human remains may contain bloodborne viruses such as hepatitis viruses and HIV and bacteria that can cause diarrhea diseases, um, salmonella, salmonella for one. Okay, so any type of exposure, you know, I mean, that you want to make sure that you can try to wash yourself as soon as possible to, uh, to prevent any um, any after effects on that. 
Um, how about how about animals and insects? Yeah, that's that's a particular that's a big problem. You know, realize weeks on end. Uh, how about some animals, um, stray animals? Uh, you know, the, you know, uh, if there's any dead animals, especially in residences, you saw in the previous well, one of the previous photos that there was a um, you know beware beware of dog. In some cases, they'll be marked on on a particular dwelling that uh, you know with a particular mark that there be a dead animal or unfortunately a body uh, inside the residence. So you want to you know, be aware of all that, but uh, but a animals is a, is a pretty big deal. There was a uh, one residence down, I believe it was in uh, Harvey or Katrina, uh, had was known to have like 25 snakes um, went in the aftermath when he went into uh, the dwelling to see uh, if there was anybody in there. They found 25 snakes, snakes in one dwelling. That's pretty pretty alarming. Um, in North Carolina, following the uh, the Hurricane Florence, there was um, a Maybe some of you have ever heard of this, but a new type of speed uh, mosquito called a zebra mosquito is just like 30 times bigger than a normal size uh, mosquito. That's pretty big. Um, and you know why? Why do they dwell in there? Well, I showed you some pictures where you clean out your residence and all that equip all that material is out in front of your house for weeks on end until it's disposed of. You know, uh, and all that wet material, such as like a couch, a chair, um, is a breeding ground for mosquitoes. And so, uh, these uh, and mosquitoes love um, in standing water. That's where they uh, basically plant their eggs. Um, um, but you know, Hurricane Florence that hit the um, the Carolinas it dumped about. It's known to. It's been recorded that it dumped more than 30 inches of rain. So that's a pretty um, substantial rain. So. Um, they had a big problem with these mosquitoes, and um, you know there was thousands and thousands of them. Uh, so be aware of that. So here's a snake, and you know this is not uncommon. You know, or alligators, anything that's been uh, disrupted in the water, and you know it. Uh, you know you're going into your residence after the fact. You know, um, or um, you got to be aware. There's a potential. There's always a potential because once it got in the house through the water, um, it could be stuck. Don't know its bearings to get out. That kind of thing. Right. And this is a, um, and of course, you know, uh, you know, if you were bitten, of course, you're going to go see medical attention whatsoever um, immediately. But uh, that's a big snake picture here. Um, <clears throat> not common. So there's other protective measures, you know. Uh, you know, if, uh, you know, people don't really think of much sunscreen. Why do they need sunscreen? Well, it's you know, uh, you know, it could, it could could be very hot out there and over a period of time, um, you know. So, rain gear, you know, I mean, you, you saw Hurricane Florence, I mentioned it had 30 inches of rain in a short period of time. That's uh, that's quite a bit. You know, insect repellents, DEET, especially with these mosquitoes, other potential uh, PPE such as a respirator is very big. How about a personal flotation device? You know, some of these waters are really big, uh, deep. Um, I had some watermarks and other pictures that uh, the water that came in it was over 10 feet in depth. You know, so um, you know, uh, it's pretty uh, pretty bad deal. Okay, um, other resources. Now these these slides that I just showed you are all included on that app um, to uh, <clears throat> to include many others. I'm just showing you some highlights of the app, and I think you'll you'll find it very useful. Um, um, other resources are available to you um, um, through the OSHA um, OSHA website, as you can see here. Okay, and this one's pretty big. It's, you know, you can see all these little windows. Starts off an introduction, preparedness, response, and recovery, um, and then we'll share. Um, so I'll just give you a couple little little slides of what's available. Some of the OSHA's uh, resources, um, like Area Lips, it's done in Spanish. They're basically quick carts, as you can see on the phone on the right hand side. Um, they're pretty good, um, pretty good, well, well done resources. So that um, you can get an overview of the safety, safety precautions that you should take based on, you know, the subject. Uh, portable ladders. That's one of the big things too. You know, people using ladders to get under roofs and what have you, or not properly, um, <clears throat> properly setting the ladders correctly, not tying it off, um, overloading it, uh, using it beyond what it's uh, designed to do. Um, how about using portable generators? I mean, you, I mean, after in the aftermath, it's not uncommon where you can also have no power for uh, a long period of time. So a lot of portable generators will be being used. So there's some carbon monoxide could be a problem. 
Um, and, and in most cases, it definitely is a problem. All right, so um, these quick cards will come of use for that. Um, how to handle the mold? How about, how about lead? Um, you know, how to, what about rescuing of animals? Respirators, rodents, snakes. So I mean, it's quite a bit off that website. And and some that are, uh, you know, some of our little quick cards, some are a little bit more of a fact sheet, eight and a half by 11, and, and it'll give you some guidelines on some cleanups. Um, what do you do after a flood? Uh, you know, how to prevent, you know, what, what can you do as a pre-incident? What can you do pre-disaster? You know, so um, those are, these are, I think, are very handy. How about the black widow? What does it look like? You know, where do you find them? Where do they lurk? Um, the Black Widow and the Brown of the Cruise are one of the biggest things um, that are uh, numerous, uh, apparently numerous after a storm. I mean, they're always looking around, but after after an event like that, they, they seem to all come up. It's easy. All right, so, um, so there's a, like I said, there's a lot of other um, fact sheets here, um, you know, that are available to the website. Also, I, I really encourage you to go to CPWR's website. We have uh, hazard alert cards. There's a number of them. Um, I think the titles are up to about uh, 24, I believe. Um, they're, they're ever increasing. Um, I think there'll be a, some benefit, and they're free. They're downloaded for free. So uh, check out the website, and uh, you can download them. Lighting, blackout, pagout. And, you know, during, you know, uh, people, you may even overlook confined spaces. So you go into the residence after fact, and if you go down in the basement after, that's that's considered uh, be considered confined space. You got a lot of uh, dangers uh, lurking in, in there, so it's something to consider. God forbid you had a snake in there, so uh, you definitely don't want to go there without lighting. Um, you know, so you you want to make sure that you're set up for that. Other additional resources um, that can help you prepare for a uh, the responding to a, a, a hurricane um, are also listed here right off the OSHA website. So. Um, you know, the American Red Cross, um, they also provide you, a, <clears throat> they have an app, I believe, and they have a, an also a checklist. What do you do when there's power outage? Um, you know, slip, trip, and falls are, you know, there's a number of uh, resources for slip, trip, and falls during it, uh, during the, in the response method. Um, but uh, in addition, you know, uh, when you go in, um, you know, <clears throat> so your residents, other factors that you want to, I mentioned earlier, asbestos, lead, Mode, uh, mold and uh, radon. I, I didn't really mention the radon, but that's another, that's another, uh, um, you know, potential exposure that you could have is radon. So, um, and down here on the bottom, there are some leaks that you can get you some, you know, some safe practices um, in the event that you are are exposed to that. Um, and on the right-hand side, this again, this is one-stop shop. You know, on, on, on the uh, the OSHA website, the American Red Cross has Get Emergency, uh, an app, and they're very comparable. You know, some of them you can you can never have enough um, information. Is what I want you to want you to realize. Um, one big thing too, after the event, uh, you know, going to the cleanup or response, um, you take a look at this picture here on the right. Um, you can imagine what's going on with that young woman's mind. You know. Uh, you know, the stress of having to clean this up on top of, you know, dealing with family, uh, you know, uh, disruption, kids, um, work, employment, no vehicle. I mean, so um, they, there is a, there's a lot of resources available. There's a, actually a distress helpline, help if you can read the, uh, uh, the slide on the left-hand side, uh, because you're, you're not alone. I mean, there's a lot of enough, enough people that are very conscious of, how this, uh, you know, uh, surviving an event of any of, of something of this magnitude can be very, very um, taxing on an individual, it's stressing. So um, we're, we're learning that now, and uh, um, that's what's good about this program. It provides a worker with an overview, so they have uh, like an idea of what they, they what they could be looking at, you know, to better prepare themselves. Okay, uh, I mean, there's a number of hazards in this photograph. I like to use photographs, um, but words can't describe them. I mean, you don't know what that person's actually feeling. I can imagine, you know, I can imagine, but, you know, there's a lot going on there. There's a, there's a, there's a lot of hazards. She does have gloves on, but I can't really tell how protective her boots are. You know, it could be sneakers, and, you're, you know, you're walking in that muck, uh, you know, um, you know, and so forth. So. 
Um, you definitely would want glasses, and you don't want any of that stuff spraying on you. So that's what we're dealing with. Okay. And the next slide, one other good resource is the FEMA app. And if you were to, you know, like I said, I, I really encourage you to download the, download the CPWRs app, and you'll see how uh, resourceful it is. And if there's anything that you could, um, you would think that should be added to that app, or you find any discrepancies, please shoot me an email, and I'll try to get that resolved. Um, <clears throat> Um, but I think I think you'll find um, between the FEMA and CPWR, uh, at, you know the, <clears throat> uh, the American Red Cross. I think you'll find it very beneficial. Okay. All right. So in summary, the hazards and issues are dynamic and require vigilance and flexibility. I want you to know that every disaster is going to be different. You know, you might have to respond to it differently. There might be different hazards from one uh, one event to the other. Or one from or one building to the other, you know, uh, you know. So everything's uh, very unique. But at the very ba at the very base level, you should have a pair of safety glasses, gloves, boots, and if it's possible, a respirator at the very least. Especially if you're going to go in and start demoing um, different areas. Okay. So um, <clears throat> if there's any questions, I encourage you to send them in to Jessica, and we'll uh, we'll uh, take care of. Okay. Jessica? Thanks, Mike. Um, I, we do have one question already. Um, wondering if you are able to go back to the uh, organization of the command center slide, um, if you can give any more detail um, on the functions of each level um, or, or, you know, uh, what? Yeah. yeah, this slide right here? Yeah. 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 Well, you know, basically, you know, um, you know, you have, yeah, you know, the the, the first responders are going to have, uh, they're going to set up an incident command center, and you know, everybody's going to have to. So, they, so they have to know who's out there in the area, and it trickles down, you know. And so they're going to, they want to make sure that there's no other contractors that are in the area that are going to be doing some work that can affect another another person within that respective area. So you got to have somebody in control, uh, so they know who's there and uh, uh, who's qualified to be there. So there's, um, these these services are are uh, you know, properly uh, properly you know properly being taken care of. If that makes any sense. Yeah. So um, it, it's a critical part of the the whole thing is having an incident commander. Okay. Um. Does the app include any OSHA-related information, including worker rights and links um, or downloads to safety and health outreach resources? Um, can I? Can you say that again? Does the app include any OSHA-related information? For example, I think you you did mention workers' rights. Yeah, workers' um, rights. Yeah. So, yes, it does. It, it has the, the the workers' rights, and you know, um, you know, other. Uh, I think it, it, it I think it's um, references like uh, the, some of the standards, such as the respiratory standards, 1910, 134. Um, um, offhand, I don't know of any other major um, references to OSHA, um, but um, other than the ones I just mentioned, yeah. uh, has com has a communications part of the one too. So, um, yeah. Okay. But, uh, Does it have any links to the OSHA resources that you shared, or um, do they separately have to go to the OSHA website for this? Well, actually, I don't. I don't think it does. I don't think. I think it just um, lists the OSHA resources. I don't know if the app actually can send you to a can link you into the OSHA website. I'm not quite sure on that one. Um, I haven't I haven't done it that way, um, but you know what? If if we if we can, well, you know the reason why I would say you probably can't because it's um, you're supposed to be able to use this once it's downloaded on your phone, whether you have internet or not. So if it's going to link you to, you know, I guess I don't know if I have to. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen a link in within the app. So I, I don't think I don't think one exists. To tell you the truth. Okay. Um, what happens during disaster response when OSHA is not enforcing OSHA standards? Should you file a complaint? 
Well, a lot of cases, it's, if you're working with an employer, yes, I would go through your chain of command. You know, you should have a competent person there identifying some of the hazards that are so, that are in that job. Um, yes, I mean, but if you're a volunteer, um, you know, that's a, that's a different story. Yeah, if you're working if you're working for an employer, you, you most definitely can can uh, file a complaint uh, using your chain of command. Any more questions? Oh, sorry, I'm on mute. Um, the next question was, um, is the organizational structure the same for technological hazards as for responding to a natural hazard? Well, I, I think I think they um, I think they'll they'll be very similar. In some cases, they'll just going to add uh, add a little bit more, um, you know. Um, Personnel to this chart, you know, responsible responsible personnel, you know, it, it all depends. But this is just a basic, you know, basic overall view of how a organizational chart looks like, you know, on an incident commander, you know. But you know, like one disaster to the other, you're going to have additional, you're going to have you potentially additional hazards, so you'll have additional uh, links in the chain. If that, if that makes sense. Um, I yes, have, yes. Um, sorry, um, and follow up to the uh, previous question, um, if OSHA standards can be um, suspended during cleanup um, or disaster response, who can make that decision and what conditions, under what conditions? Well, sometimes it, you know it, it, the initial response of trying uh, public safety trying to get in there and it, um, you know uh, recover uh, or uh, um, rescue some p um, pedestrians people um, that might be an area where you know in, in some cases they're going to I mean they're going to put they're going to put the people safe you know going in there doing the rescue but uh, in some cases it's about rescuing that individual uh, that they uh, they kind of like. Um, suspend all OSHA situations, uh, all OSHA protections, you know, because they're going in to, to rescue uh, a person without um, jeopardizing the safety of the rescue uh, people, if that makes sense. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, would you be able to conduct training um, during or at the, at the same time that you are responding to a disaster, or is it necessary to do it in advance? Well, it's, it's ideally to do everything in advance. You know, you want to train and do, uh, you know, some type of uh, orientation before you go in. Okay, yeah. So yeah, so you, you really you really want to do some type of training before you go in. So they have an idea of what they're going to be suspected. They have an idea of what their role is going to be, what they're going to, the you know, um, what they're going to be responsible uh, in doing, um, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, just related to that, I um, received a comment um, that I just made public in the chat box um, recommending that employers look into community emergency response training for businesses that may be offered by local emergency management organizations. Um, and there is a link um, there as well yeah. to check out. That's great. Um, Thanks for posting that. Um, yeah, the CERT, CERT programs, uh, you know, those that are really um, want to get really involved, on it, I really encourage you to contact your uh, community emergency response training teams. Um, you know, they're all over, they, they're very active, um, you know, um, and they, they can help you guide, guide yourself in training um, and, and to do, and what to do in, in the event of a, uh, of a disaster in your area. 
you know, so that's good. Um, and the other thing I would mention is uh, Mike talked about uh, CPWR's hazard alert cards, and they are, they're free to download um, online, but we also make these little pocket versions of them. So they are um, less a training tool and more of a quick reference guide and, um, you know, reminder of the most important things related to a hazard. And those could easily be handed out, um, you know, on site um, for, for the people involved to have just a quick reference card for the work that they're doing to know what hazards to be aware of and how to avoid them. Um, the next question, I don't think either of us will be able to answer, but we can certainly investigate. Um, are there any CPWR data or studies done um, that show where workers are being hurt during cleanup and recovery? For example, falls, hazardous material cleanup. Um, we have a whole data center that publishes um, all different types of data on um, injuries, the illnesses, and fatalities. I just don't know if they specifically have published a report on cleanup and recovery. I don't know, Mike, if, if you know that offhand. No, that's a very good question. I don't know if they even went, uh, no, I, don't, I have no idea. If anybody's even looking at that at this point, um, you know, uh, that's a very good question. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I think what I, what I will do is check in with Sue Dong, um, who has our data center, and see if she does have any information. If she does, I can email that out along with the recording after the event. Um, and if she does not, um, maybe this is an area that um, she's able to look into in the future, and we will be able to generate a report on it. I believe that was the... Oh, Okay, so the comment related to that, um, there was a DOL ELS study a couple of years ago on disaster cleanup related deaths. So um, uh, folks can look for that link. I'll, I will try to look for that link before I email to, and I can send that out if I find it. Thank you, Chip. Okay, um, I, that was all of our questions. Um, so if you do have any follow-up questions, um, you can reach out, sorry, we just got one more question in. Um, are the OSHA Vietnamese resources new? They are new to me. I see they are limited to certain topics. Do you know if the Vietnamese population is geographically specified? Now, I'm not sure about that. I know OSHA is um, consistently expanding their translated resources. I, also know that they do a lot of the um, automatic translation options on um, their videos so uh, that it's um, just choosing the um, probably like main Vietnamese um, dialect and language or you know uh, for every langu language um, and it's just automatically translating them. Um, and then we have a comment that they are, they are new um, and they are specific to a certain region in 2017 where there was a large Vietnamese population. Thank you for that response, Chris. Um, and that was done after hurricanes and flooding. Okay. All right, so as I was saying, if you have questions that weren't answered today, um, we are happy to answer them afterward. If you um, email us, I will, I'm not sure if Mike's um, email is in the presentation, so I am putting it right now in the chat box. Um, you can respond to the follow-up email I send, and if we don't have the answers, we will do our best to track them down. Um, or track people down who will have them for you. So thank you, Mike, for presenting, and thank you, everyone, for listening in. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.